It's known as Sportsman's Paradise, where canopies of Spanish moss blanket giant oaks. The sun beats the swamp, and the mightiest river flows into tranquil lakes. But just beneath the surface runs a wicked current that flows through every state and nation and threatens the lives of the most vulnerable. The room was disgusting. The men were disgusting. They stunk. Their skin was sticky. Wait, wait, wait. I am an investigator with Louisiana State Police. I'm in the Special Victims Unit. I mean, they wanted to sell me to a drug addict for um, $300. It's a lot easier to sell a human and make money than drugs. He told me I was going to die. He wanted me to be prepared to die. He knew that whatever he was going to do to me wasn't going to be nice. These are the faces of three, held captive and sold for cash. They reveal their faces and their stories to destigmatize victims and change the narrative. See us, hear us, help us, fight them. I think there's a time when we were told growing up that certain things weren't our business. And I say these children are absolutely 100% our business. Donna Edwards becomes the first lady of Louisiana when her husband, John Bell, is elected governor in 2016. She, along with police. People say, what can I do about this? This has nothing to do with me. Everybody has a part in saving a person's life, period. The FBI. Wait, wait. This is new at nine. Dozens of sex trafficking victims were rescued recently. That's according to the FBI. Survivors. Trust me, I wanted to give up, but nope, you can't give up. Because if you give up, you let the enemy win. We just welcome them and love them as they are when they come. And a group of nuns running a secret healing center in the backwoods of Louisiana have teamed up against a common foe, sex trafficking, and perhaps the natural inclination to turn away. They deserve for us to stand up for them, to talk about what they're going through, to save them, to, to bring them back. But to bring them back, you must understand where they've been and how they got there. She was the girl who cried herself to sleep while holding on to a secret that wasn't hers to keep. She was the girl who got anxiety at the sound of any man's voice. She was the girl in first grade who already knew about boys. Starting in preschool, Megan is molested by family long before she is trafficked by strangers. Her poetry becomes a form of therapy. You know, my mom didn't always have the best characters around. I know she suffered from addiction problems. Molested while Allie is still in diapers, her mother moves her to Louisiana to escape, but it happens again at age 10. She felt okay enough to leave me with this man as a babysitter while she went to work, and he gave me a pill to take. I don't remember going to bed. I don't remember getting in the bed. I don't remember eating anything, but I do remember waking up the next day in my mom's bed at home, naked. You never know what could happen. It could happen in your hometown. It can happen in your backyard. Mine happened in, in the backyard. By your own family. By my own family. Thought I could trust them, but you can't. realized this was happening. I thought these people loved me, but they were just using me. It's Danny who opens the eyes of the First Lady to sex trafficking. That it can happen anywhere, even in her sleepy hometown, where her own children knew of Danny and her captors. It's hard to believe that this is happening in our own backyards. It's hard to believe that this happens in a community that's as small as ours. She was the light switch for you. She was the light switch. They fed her 
the ashes of her deceased mother. What kind of a mind does that? Five people accused of holding a woman with autism captive for an entire year are now facing federal charges. My name is Danny, I'm a survivor. Danny clutches a fidget for comfort as she recounts the past. Just out of frame sits her support team of caregivers, social workers, and a state-appointed advocate. There are going to be people that are going to be wondering why you're showing your face. I want people to know that I'm the one that was held captive for a year. I'm the one that was held against her will. There was abuse, and I'm the one that has autism, and I'm proud of it. It has been seven years since Danny's relatives beat her, starved her, locked her in this backyard cage made of chicken wire and tarp, and sold her for sex. Like, I try to escape, you know, but when they have guns pointed on you, you know, they threaten you, like, hey, if you, you leave again, we're going to kill you, you know? You know, you have to stay there, you know, fight for your life. Fight for your life every day and not give up. Danny would take the fight to court, addressing her captors in a victim impact statement that sent them to their own cages in federal penitentiaries. That, after she was rescued by police in 2016, a day she'll never forget, followed by a dream she won't either. June 29th, um, I saw my mom. My mom came to me in a dream, and she said that everything's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. You're going to get out of here. I'm like, what do you mean, Mom? She's like, I can't tell you that. Just trust me, baby. And when the minute I saw them cop cars come, like, this is what she was meaning. This is what she was saying, that you, you're coming out. That's what happens with, you know, traffickers. They want, if you, if you got special needs, if something like autism, Down syndrome, you know, whatever it is, they want to take advantage of you because you're vulnerable. And that's what it's all about, is manipulation and control. Trafficking is not, it does not see socioeconomics. It's about vulnerability. That's what it's about. The problem is, is, Unfortunately, we have a lot of these children don't have a family. I've had victims tell me in interviews, I've been in seven foster homes in the last two weeks. What are you gonna bring me home to? As a child, Allie prefers juvenile detention to foster care and group homes. She acts up to get locked up. And that was home, the people there, we're home, we're like parents. Juvenile detention, the guards. Yeah. They, they played cards with me. They drew with me. They wrote with me. They read what I wrote. It mattered to them. And I just felt hurt. Even though, you know, I was in like a small cell the size of someone's bathroom, you know, I felt like, okay, I know they're gonna come by in 20 minutes. Um, I know tomorrow I can pick me out a new book. I know in the morning I'm gonna have breakfast. You know, they know I don't like milk dish juice. Most of all, she likes sleeping alone. She's been trafficked since she was 11. When a friend's family offers to take her in after she runs away from her drug addicted mother. She said, yeah, you can come spend the night with me. So I get in the car with them, and there's like a, a older man. You could call him in like her trick or her sugar daddy, the mom's trick. I get in the car, and he's the first one to like speak to me. He was like, you know where you're going, huh? And I was like, yeah, to my friend's house. He was like, no, you're going to call Fax. That night, in a cramped house in Colfax, Louisiana, Allie, a sixth grader, is sexually assaulted by a 19-year-old man. Obviously, there's many hotels right off the interstate. It's in and out access, easy access. It happens at the truck stops, too. It happens everywhere. So we have our major corridors in Louisiana. We have I-20, which is up north, and then we have 49, I-49 that comes down through Alexandria, and then we have I-10 that comes from Texas and turns into I-12. By night two, Allie is trafficked in hotels along I-49 near Alexandria by the very friend who took her in. 
And I remember her turning to her mom and asking her mom, well, mom, how much for two girls? And you know, how much for one who's never done it before? Like many trafficked children, a female trafficker escorts her to the room. She is 11 years old. I remember her brother would sit on the stairs and like wait for us to come, you know, out of their room. And uh, my first time going in, I didn't know like what to do or, you know, how to behave or any of that. And I remember being offered a drink. Their skin was sticky. I felt sticky and disgusted. I felt small. Like mentally, I felt myself physically shrink. Um, I felt this small. It is so important to listen when a kid isn't talking. She was the girl who held her pain behind her smile as a mask. She was the girl who needed help, but didn't feel worthy enough to ask. I think when I was little, I really felt alone because I don't know. I just, I didn't feel open where I was to be able to communicate or be open. And that little girl just needed a hug sometimes. Um, she just needed to feel loved. To hear her say those words makes me want to be sick because I think about the times have I ignored signs. You know, as a former teacher, I think, how many kids in my classroom? You know, as a music teacher, it's also the, every kid in the entire school. And I think about that often. You know, I think about certain children and the way they acted. Megan is four when a family member starts molesting her. Seven years pass before an art teacher asks a simple question. She pulled me aside one day and just asked me if I was okay. She's like, you don't look okay, are you something wrong? And I just broke down. I fell in love with the food, the <laughs> the weather, just, um, just the southern hospitality. In the picturesque town of Mandeville, Megan happily reunites with her mother, but her mother is struggling financially. She wanted me down here. I believe it, like she did out of the goodness of her heart, but when it fell apart, she didn't try to pick it back up. She kind of let it just unravel. She lost her house, so I was already bouncing around to friends I already knew. And I ended up just meeting the wrong person. Megan meets Jared on Facebook a full year before she meets him in person. She thinks she's vetting him, protecting herself. Jared is grooming her the whole time and offers her a safe place to stay with his dad while her mom gets back on her feet. From the time he picked me up, I regretted it. I regretted even on the car ride to New Orleans, on the causeway, I, I was scared because he didn't look like the pictures at all. He was a lot bigger. I now know he had just got out of prison. So you're driving over the causeway. What's going through your mind? At this point, I'm, I'm hesitant, but I'm already in the car. And in my head, this person is not going to do that, do nothing to me. I've been talking to him for a year. You know, I know this person in my head. Megan is brought to a hotel where there are other girls. She is taken on a shopping spree for new clothes, makeup, and a manicure. Three days later, she is drugged and trafficked for the first time. Her hell continues for nine months. I was 16. 
I spent my birthday, my, my 17th birthday in a hotel. And, and then as soon as I turned 17, they arrested me and, and called me a prostitute. And as soon as I got out of jail, he took me to a different hotel. That's when I realized I'm gonna die here. And by the grace of God, the FBI came and did a SWAT and rescued me and another girl. You can't unhear it. Um, you can't unknow the information and you can't walk away. So I knew that what I could do was, I, I call myself the connector, and so I could connect everybody. First Lady Donna Edwards uses her influence to raise awareness. She invites state lawmakers to the governor's mansion, fellow first spouses to Zoom calls where they share what's worked in their states, and inspires her husband to create the governor's office of human trafficking. You know, it's a bipartisan issue, right? And so um, it, people come together on those issues. It's one of those issues you don't have to say much because it's the right thing to do. And when it's the right thing to do, it comes together. Laws are passed. One expunges the criminal records of victims forced to commit sexual crimes. Another mandates truck stop employees along busy interstates be educated on the signs of trafficking and how to report it. Similar measures will educate hospital employees. And there's another connection the First Lady makes through, of all places, the Vatican. We know that all of us here today believe in the fight for freedom for these victims so they might have joyful life and hope for the better future. In 2016, Louisiana leaders break ground on a secret healing center, Metanoia, a place founded by Father Jeff Bahi and inspired by a Vatican nun. It translates to change of heart, a place where girls hardened by trafficking are loved into a state of peace and hope. I just think that when they broke ground on Magnolia, they broke a little bit through hell, and the devil don't like that at all. To have a little piece of heaven sitting on top of what he called his, he would never like that. And to find so much peace in a place like that, it was amazing. It was beautiful. When you first get there, I mean, it's so beautiful outside, and then when you go inside, it only gets more beautiful. It was a very peaceful place, but more than it being a peaceful place, the people, they had the most amazing people running that place. The five nuns are from the Philippines, Madagascar, Nigeria, and India. Four are trained nurses. One is a social worker. Their mission, to serve God by serving the girls. Megan and Allie are the very first to arrive. Well, the healing started as soon as I got there. I fell in love with those nuns, and I feel like they fell in love with me. My first question is, do you have kids? To Sister Anna Maria, and she was like, no. I was like, did that make us your kids? She said, yeah. That's what we are trying to instill in them, that there is hope for a better future. Forget the past, and you will get there. We are here to accompany you to get there. I would get under the table when I felt stressed, that's safe for me because I can get under there and like it was like a hiding spot. It was plenty of days, plenty of nights too. Even past bedtime, I, I got the poor nun sitting out of bed. She's sitting in the corner of the conference room and I'm under the conference room table. But she wouldn't leave me. And I mean, she's going to get snacks. She's trying to get under the table with me. And um, if it wasn't one of them, it was all of them waiting for me to come under the table. You know, they was throwing me a life jacket, bringing those snakes. Like, you can sit here as long as you need to. 
because I'll bring you whatever you need while you're under that table. And um, they would bring me books to read under that table. I was never ashamed for being under the table. How did they earn my trust? They gave me time, the time I needed. If I was, wasn't feeling it that day, I would be up in my room. Sister would bring me a cookie. Said, Megan, you want a cookie? Or just her spirit. Sister Norma sat in one night and just cried with me. And that's what I needed. And she didn't preach to me. She just sat with me and let me cry and cried with me. I never had that before. The girls received medical care, therapy, and education. Both finish high school. The nuns teach them how to sew, cook, grow, nurture, play music, play basketball, and laugh again. But it's not easy. The nuns are on call 24-7. They've broken up fist fights, chased would-be runaways into the woods. Sister Ruth even stopped one girl in the midst of a suicide attempt. So she went to her bathroom, tried to hang herself. Fortunately, because I go always to check them in their rooms, I went there and I found her, and I grabbed her, took off whatever she already put on her neck to put that there. That was, I don't know, was, a very big shock since I came here. Whenever I remember that incident, it's still not going away from my mind. I hold her tight. 90 girls successfully come through the program. Only one is Catholic, none converts, none of that matters. Uh, I, I think this program, a lot of people involved in order to be successful, because not only the sisters, we have a program director that makes sure that the program is running, and not only focusing on their trauma and whatever they need every day. Also, they need education to move on. They need life skills, so we need volunteers, full-time teachers, therapists. They open me up to a lot of different activities, writing, painting, the first lady would come and she would play the piano for us. She just kept coming back. She always made time for us, like each and every one of us. She would talk to us individually. We had piano lessons with her individually. She was ready to see artwork. She was ready to hear poems. She was ready to read them if you weren't comfortable reading your own. Like she was ready to hear about how you're doing in school. She was ready to hear about what you wanted to do after you get out of here. She was willing to listen to how much you miss home. You know, she was willing to listen to and watch you cry as well as like comfort you during your crying. I wanted them to feel normal. I wanted them to feel loved. I wanted them to, to know that somebody cared about them in a way that is loving and nurturing. An outside observer might say you were trying to make up for what they lost. I think so, because I'm sorry for what they went through. I mean, we all should be. Allie and Megan have aged out of the Metanoia program, but the two remain in contact, saying they are sisters. Megan is now a mother of two, in a healthy, loving relationship with the boy's father. Allie is engaged. Well, come on in. Their journey to healing takes them to the governor's mansion, where they reunite with the first lady and share their desire to give back. The survivors now want to advocate for victims. You love these girls. I do, very much. Meanwhile, at the manor, the nuns are caring for eight new girls, the youngest just 11. It is a revolving door. Do you realize the impact you've had on them? Tell you the truth, I don't. They credit you and your sisters for helping them to heal, move forward, to love. 
and to raise their own families. It has been five years since Megan left their care. The reunion is as joyful as it is emotional. Megan, we want to tell you that we see you. Oh, we see you. I know that you said that you want to help, and I think that's so brave of you. And it just shows the healing that has happened within you. You know, you're doing amazing, and we're so proud of you. I just want you to know that. Thank you. And sisters, I just want to say thank you and for all the sacrifices y'all made that I may have not have realized at the time. And as a mother now, I realize how important of a role y'all played in my life and how important of a role y'all played in my children's life and the kind of mother I am because of y'all. Because y'all gave me that family, that sense of family that I never had. Y'all opened up y'all's home and y'all's hearts and y'all's entire life to me. And if there's ever a day where you wake up and you're just dragging your feet at the manor, I just want y'all to know that everything y'all do is just really amazing and it really does matter and you do make a huge difference. The fight to end trafficking never ends. As long as there are people willing to pay for sex, children will be sold to meet the demand. It is said that drugs are consumed once, but a child can be sold 10 times a day. The trade is growing, but so is awareness. You know, at the end of the day, I am thankful that people are starting to notice more and it's being reported more. Just be aware. If it doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. You know, I like to thank God. I like to thank my support system. And most of all, I want to thank my mom. She's not here anymore. I want, I want to thank her and, you know, and my amazing friends. Danny was too old to go to the manor, but she too has found healing. And like Allie and Megan, wants to become an advocate for special needs survivors. We all here for you. We, we can be your survive, survivor sister, you know. If you need someone to talk to, somebody to vent to, someone to cry with, I'm here. I would tell my younger self, you're destined for greatness, which is what I've always told my younger self. I want more. I feel like I deserve more, and I feel like I can make more. The tide is turning. There is no shame in survival. Once invisible, they claim their space in the sun, proof that from hell can emerge a life of healing and hope.